What looks like a pot full of chili is actually part of a recipe that could spice up the exterior of any home. Hello, I'm Michael Holligan. Welcome to your new house. Today, Steve Easley takes you to a factory where they use all natural ingredients to cook up great looking cement siding that's extremely durable and easy to install. And a roaring fire is great on a cold night, but a badly maintained fireplace can turn cozy and safe into trouble. Super handyman Al Carroll has easy fireplace maintenance tips. We have all this plus a lot more coming up right now on your new house. Imagine being able to have a fireplace anywhere in your home, in the kitchen, in a breakfast nook, out in the middle of your family room, or even underneath a big picture window. That's now possible with a direct vent gas fireplace. Well, the first question you have to ask is, where does all the smoke go? There was no flue where the windows were. Justin's already found the answer over here. Justin, I see you found heat out here on a cold day. And uh, Where does the smoke go on a direct vent fireplace? Well, it's going to go in this particular installation just right out the exterior wall. So you don't have to go up with the flue? No, you don't have to. Okay. And I see here, and you've got a little example that you've got two pipes on this. W what are they doing? That's correct. The flue is made of double-walled pipe. Uh, the exterior layer is going to pull in your air for combustion and the interior layer is going to expel all of your gases. Okay, so our gas comes out here and then we're drawing air in here. So we're actually burning cold air from outside. We're not sucking the air we've already paid to heat that inside to burn the fire. Okay, so we're going to save some money with that. I know a lot of people have the old systems where they just pulled it out of the house and every time you start a fire it actually cooled down the house. So it's, Correct. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So Justin, you can really put this type of fireplace in anywhere in the house. Yes, you can run it out an exterior wall or uh, up through the ceiling and through the roof, maybe on an interior wall. Just aesthetically whatever looks better in your house? That's correct. And then it's not putting out any smoke, so we must really be burning a lot of gas. That's all it's putting out. Uh, can you do it with conventional? wood or does it really need to be gas? It has to be gas for a direct vent system. Direct vent fireplaces are assembled in a factory, just like prefab wood burning fireplaces you see in new homes everywhere these days. But these direct vent fireplaces are giving wood burning models a run for their money. They're much more energy efficient and a growing demand means there's a lot of variety to choose from. With just a little shopping, it's easy to find the look you like in a fireplace with impressive heat output. Well, being a gas log system, we've got a solid sheet of glass instead of any opening where we can throw in logs, but I feel a lot of heat. How does it get out of there? It radiates heat. Just right through the glass? Yes, sir. And then running a gas fireplace, I mean, is it expensive to do in the wintertime? Or are we radiating enough heat it actually is warming our house? Uh, it is cost efficient. Of course, depending on uh, how high you have your flame set is going to depend on how much gas is being used but it does put off a lot of heat. There are three different types of gas fireplaces. There's a vent-free fireplace, which uses no chimney, a B-vent fireplace, which uses a single layered chimney, and room air for combustion. The biggest advantage a direct vent fireplace has is that it is a sealed system. With this pane of glass here, we're not losing the heated air we've already paid for just rushing up the chimney. We're pulling all of our combustion air through the pipe that's already outside in and then expelling it back outside. Both direct vent and B vent fireplaces will cost you anywhere from about $1,000 to around $3,000. Some direct vent fireplaces are large enough to allow for a 48 inch window into the firebox, which allows you to have a very big fire. Vent free models start at around $2,000, but due to the gas that they release into your home, experts within the fireplace industry disagree about their safety but they do produce a lot of heat because there's no chimney or vent to the outdoors. All that heat is contained inside the home. The latest versions have built-in catalytic converters that clean the heated air of potentially harmful pollutants before it's released into the home. Even with these latest improvements, vent-free units are prohibited in a few states and cities, so check your local construction code before you decide to install one. If you're trying to choose between a direct vent and a B-vent fireplace, the location you've chosen in your home may help you decide. If you're going to recess the fireplace into a wall, you can go with a B-vent, but you'll need to add a frame chase to enclose the flue. If you don't like that idea, you might want to go with the direct vent model. A lot of manufacturers offer both types in very similar looking fireplaces. Either way you go, a gas fireplace can bring the comfort and charming atmosphere of a glowing fire to any room in your house. And if you choose a unit that best suits your needs, you'll be enjoying that warm glow for years to come. 
you like more information about finding the right gas fireplace for your new house, contact us at michaelholligan.com. If you can't remember the last time you checked out your fireplace and chimney, it's been too long. Super Handyman Al Carroll has tips to help keep your fireplace and your family safe. Some old green beans, a layer of sawdust, and you've got a great recipe for compost today on The Great Outdoors. If you'd like a detailed list of the tools and materials needed for any project that you've seen on the show, you can find it on the internet at www.michaelholligan.com. You know, a fire in a fireplace can add a lot to any room. It adds charm, atmosphere, and warmth. A lot of people think all they need to do to keep the fireplace going is throw a log on the fire every once in a while and haul their ashes out. Well, there's more to it than that. We'll tell you how to get more enjoyment out of your fireplace and improve the safety. Now, before you light the first fire of the season, there's something I want you to do. I want you to take a flashlight and inspect the inside of the fireplace. What you're looking for are cracks in the mortar joints. These can act as chimneys and suck a flame up, and you can really have a problem if it gets to anything that's combustible in behind there. And I see we've got a hole right there, and I'm going to show you how to patch that in just a minute. While you've got your flashlight out, there's something else you ought to do, and that is try to look up the chimney. Now, we've already got the damper open, and we're going to take a little hand mirror. We're going to shine the flashlight up so we can see, and then we're going to angle the mirror so that we can see up the chimney. And we're going to check all along and see if we see any bird nests or anything like that. It looks fairly clean up there. Now there's one place that you're not going to be able to see, no matter how good the flashlight is or the mirror, and that's a little place that's right up here behind the damper. It's a flat area. It's called the smoke shelf. If anything has fallen down there, it's just sitting on the shelf. Actually, it can be a bad thing because if it gets wet, uh, you've got a bird nest in there or some leaves, it can cause an odor to come into your house. The worst thing is, though, that whatever falls down there is probably going to be combustible. If any sparks hit it, you could have a fire in the chimney. What we have to do is put a glove on. You're going to reach over the smoke shelf, and you're going to reach back and feel along down there, all the way along the smoke shelf. It's a little bit cramped to get up there, but it's well worth it. It's something that needs to be done. But be sure you wear that glove. Well, there doesn't seem to be anything up here on the smoke shelf, except a lot of soot, but we can live through that. As far as patching the crack back here, there are two ways you can go. You can buy this fireplace cement that's in a cartridge for use with a caulking gun, or you can get it already mixed up and use a putty knife. We're going to use this because it's the easy way. The first thing you need to do before you start patching, however, is to wet down the area very thoroughly. And I've got another little place down here I'm going to wet down. And now we just squeeze this in place. And I'll get this place down here. Now one thing I like about this particular patch is the fact that it's black. The stuff that we used last year to do all this patching here was gray and it never has smoked over and it sort of sticks out like a sore thumb. And we've been talking about a masonry fireplace. Probably the most popular fireplaces these days are the prefabs. And we just happen to have one upstairs. Let's go take a look. Now this is a prefab unit that we installed several years ago and I really like it because it has a lot of efficiency. It really gives you a lot of warmth. You do have to be concerned about any cracks though. And if you have a crack in one of these pieces, they're all solid pieces, it's probably not going to be practical to try to repair it because it won't look that good. But you can get replacement parts and they are a do-it-yourself project. This is one of the side pieces. This is a back piece here. And if you'll save the owner's manual, it'll have all these parts numbered so you can order exactly the one you need, just like you order appliance parts. We do have some concern about the safety of the unit and it involves the flu outside, so let's go up on the roof. From up here on the roof, you can see both chimneys. 
the one for the prefab and the masonry type. And you'll notice they both have caps on them. That's very important. First of all, the cap prevents a spark from flying out. It also will prevent rain from coming in. It prevents varmints from getting in there. And sometimes it prevents having a downdraft that can cause you to have a smoked up room. Now there are lots of different sizes and types of chimney caps. And if you don't want to buy one right now, at least put a spark arrestor over the top. This is hardware cloth and it will at least prevent that problem. I want to show you a little bit about this cap right here. As you can see, it's got this mesh all the way around there, and also it's closed down at the bottom down here, and that's very good. The reason being that it doesn't allow any varmints to get inside here. If they get in there, like birds, if they build a nest or squirrels build nests, you've got a fire hazard in there. We've talked a little bit about cleaning the chimney, and actually it can be a do-it-yourself project. You can buy a tool like this. It's flexible. It can be added onto with uh, extension handles. However, let me tell you a couple of things on the downside about doing it yourself. First of all, it's a dirty job. Secondly, you got to get up on the roof. And third, sometimes when you're working that brush up and down in a chimney like this from our prefab, you can break one of those sections apart and then you have a fire hazard that you may not know about until your house burns down. Well, now that you got your fireplace ready for the season, I'm going to show you a couple of neat tricks. Did you ever light the fire in your fireplace? and for the first couple of minutes, smoke just billows out here in the room. That's a bummer. It doesn't have to happen. What we're gonna do is take this rolled up newspaper, make a torch. We're gonna hold this torch when it gets lit good up here so it's gonna be right up by the damper. And the heat from the torch is gonna cause updrafts to start and that'll make it, when you start the fire down here, and make it so that all of the, the uh, smoke goes up and out the chimney the way it should. You also want to be sure you have a bucket handy to put the torch out. We don't want to cause a fire. One thing you have to remember to do is always open the damper. Now, if you don't remember to do that, there's going to be a reminder out here because I cause all of this smoke damage right up here, and I'm going to show you how to take care of it. I've got a magic formula. It involves water and some stuff called TSP. That's not a brand name. That stands for trisodium phosphate. You can get that any place where paint products are sold. And what you do is you put in a tablespoon into a pint of water. And now we're going to wet the surface up here. We're going to then put on our rubber glove because it's a good strong cleaner. You want to make sure that you don't want to injure yourself in any way. And we're going to take a brush and we're going to go to work. As you can see, it really is almost like magic. Uh, it's not going to hurt brick or stone, it's just going to remove this stuff. After you've got it all done, you might want to go over it with a damp cloth and remove any residue that might be left. Well now you're all set to safely enjoy your fireplace for another season. If you have questions about this, why don't you contact us on the internet. It's michaelholligan.com. Technology has certainly made raking leaves a lot simpler. With this vacuum sack, I can literally vacuum up the leaves, chew them into very fine particles before I add them to my compost heap. And composting is what we're talking about today. How to turn ordinary organic matter like leaves and grass clippings, even kitchen refuse, into black, rich, organic humus. Good stuff for the garden. Now here's an interesting device. This is called a compost tumbler, and it's one of many such devices that have been invented to facilitate the making of compost. What we do is we put our biodegradable materials in here, our leaves, lawn clippings, and whatnot, and then we can aerate it and mix it thoroughly by spinning it. Of course, we've got these nicely chewed up leaves Composting is a very natural process, and it simply involves the decomposition of organic materials. Now, leaves are very high in carbon, and in order to get the decomposition to work just right, we need to add some nitrogen. We can do that with nitrogen-rich materials, or we can simply add a little ordinary garden fertilizer that's high in nitrogen. And then, we've got to introduce the bacteria and the fungi, the microorganisms, 
that will actually start the decomposition process. And we introduce them by adding ordinary topsoil. Once we've got all the ingredients in there, we put the lid back on, give it a good spin to mix it thoroughly, and we wait. It's been aerated. Every week or two, we can come out and turn it. And in a few months, we'll have thick, black, rich humus. Good stuff for the garden. But let me show you another way to make compost. This is the kind of thing that most people think of when you say compost. A heap of rotting vegetation. And it's a good thing. But remember that it's got to be kept moist. It's got to be kept aerated. Composting involves aerobic decomposition, that is, with oxygen. And of course, in order for it to decompose well, we've got to have alternating layers of high nitrogen products like young green plants, and then layers of high carbon products like dead leaves. And then we add to that some topsoil. This is old sawdust. We'll top this off with some topsoil, a little fertilizer, we'll water it, and we'll stir it once every few weeks to keep it oxygenated. And next spring, we'll have some rich black gold for the garden. Another way to compost is to put it where you want it in the first place. This is the way my father did it, and I do it this way as well. I simply dig a wastebasket size hole in the vegetable garden and put in my organic matter. Remember, chop it up into small pieces if you can. It'll decompose faster. And then cave in the sides of the hole. And cover it up. And then put in another layer of organic matter. In the process of doing this, your hole gets wider and wider, and your organic matter comes closer and closer to the surface. And don't forget all that kitchen junk you've saved up in this bucket. Everything from the kitchen, excluding bones and scraps of meat and fat, should go into the garden. If it's biodegradable, it goes into the vegetable garden. Then cover it up, and by next year, you won't be able to find even one eggshell in here. It'll all decompose and become part of the soil complex. It's the easy way to compost. How quickly organic matter decomposes and becomes humus varies with the temperature, the moisture, and the actual particle size of the materials. But after a good period of time, you're going to have humus. Rich, black, good smelling organic matter. This not only supplies nutrients to your garden, but it improves the aeration and drainage of the soil as well. And it supplies antibiotics that can actually help your plants fend off disease. Compost, great stuff, black gold for your garden. Here's some quick tips on caring for your refrigerator. You can use a dollar bill to check your door gaskets to make sure that your refrigerator door is shutting tightly. Now take your dollar and close the door on it in various different locations around the refrigerator. Then pull lightly. If it budges at all, you'll know you need to replace that gasket. Now it is important to do this because a leaky gasket can waste energy and shorten the life of your compressor. It'll cost about $60, but all you have to do is loosen these screws and just slip a new one right in. Now also, about once a month, you want to clean your door gasket by using warm water and about a teaspoon of baking soda. Now this cleaning solution will not only clean it for you, but it will also help keep it soft and pliable. Then, about twice a year, or more if you have pets around the house, you need to clean your compressor coils by removing this grid at the bottom of your refrigerator and using a soft duster to dust the coils and the fan blades. But before you do this, be sure and unplug the refrigerator because you don't want to get the duster caught in the fan and ruin it. And then once a year, you want to go ahead and pull your refrigerator out and vacuum behind it to be sure and remove any dirt back there so it doesn't get caught up in the coils. Coming up next, 
Add this wood pulp to cement and you have the recipe for super strong siding on your new house. Steve Easley shows you how the process works when your new house returns. Did you know that Americans spend over $3 billion a year on siding products? We're all looking for siding that doesn't warp, rot, or buckle, or get eaten by termites. And the answer really lies in a building product that's been around for hundreds of years. It's called cement. Well, today I'm with Dave Kessner of James Hardy Building Products. Hi, Dave. Steve. And you're going to tell us why cement board siding is so popular. Well, Steve, if you look at our hardy plank siding here, you can see it's got a tremendous aesthetics. It looks just like wood grain. It's got extremely low maintenance. It holds paint three to five times longer than your standard wood-based product, and it, it's, it, it's extremely user-friendly for the consumer. Well, Steve, we, we attached this with a pneumatic gun, and I've also brought a hammer and nail out for you to try it the old-fashioned way. Well, that'll be good. I always like the old-fashioned approach. Nails pretty good. Well, you know, whether it be a pneumatic fastener or nailing by hand, I'm really amazed that it doesn't fracture or crack. What makes it so strong? Well, Steve, there's, there's some things in the factory I'd like to show you. It's right around the corner. Let's go take a look at what we're doing inside. The James Hardy facility in Cleburne, Texas is the largest fiber cement plant in the world. The company makes 300 million square feet of siding and board materials a year. Fiber cement is made from lightweight Portland cement, wood pulp, and sand. The sand is washed to get rid of impurities like clay and silt, and then it's processed again in a large grinder. Well, Dave, this is one huge grinder. What are you trying to accomplish here? Well, what we're doing here, Steve, is, is you saw those coarse particles of sand we had out where the truck was unloading? Okay, we're going to take those now, we're going to grind them up into a very fine, very consistent particle. That's what you have here, right? Um, this stuff here, it's amazing. It was sand, now it's a very small, small powder. It's like flour. You're right, Steve. It is about the same consistency as ground flour, and we do that by taking these cast balls, putting them in that mill. There's about 80 tons in that mill at any given time, and they're tumbling down, crushing up the sand. And it grinds it up into this fine consistency. Giant bales of wood pulp are also added to the mix. The bales are dumped into a 4,000-gallon tank and mixed with water. A 250-horsepower blender turns the wood pulp into a wet cardboard-like material. Well, Dave, fiber cement board siding is about 90% sand and cement. The rest of it is wood fiber. Why wood fiber? Well, Steve, this is really the, the most important ingredient for us. What wood fiber does for us is just like what reinforcing steel does for concrete. It provides the tensile strength and gives us the workability on a job so the installer can pick up a piece and not break it. And really, workability is the key thing with pulp. Why not uh, recycle newspapers? Well, when you say recycled, you mean reused. When you start reusing stuff, it loses strength. This is virgin material, and we're very particular about what goes in this bale. Quality is very important here. Once the wood pulp and sand are prepared, they are pumped into a mixing station, where they're also mixed with Portland cement. Then the mixture is channeled into a roller where the siding sheets are formed. So Dave, this is where it all comes together. Yes, we got the, we've got the sand and the cement and the wood pulp on a, on a felt right here, and we're going up towards our nip. So if I reach in here and grab some of this, you know, it, is a, it does have an amazing consistency. It feels a lot more like paper than it does cement, but yet there's only 10% or so paper in here, right? At this point in time, Steve, the, the pulp is fully saturated, unlike the material that we sell in the store, which is, which is fully dried. So it, it appears that the, there's more pulp than there actually is. So this stuff just gets laid down in layers, and then what happens? We accumulate those layers up at our roller until we get the right thickness material. And after that, it comes off the roller, and then we trim it to length and width. A giant roller embosses the wet material with a wood grain pattern. The siding basically acts like wet cardboard, but now it's ready to be cured. To get the moisture out of the material and harden the concrete, giant pallets of siding are put into an autoclave. There it's cooked under high pressure and high temperature for several hours. When it comes out, the siding is almost ready to install. As an added benefit, some of the cement siding is also given a primer coating of paint. This enables the contractor or consumer to paint the house as soon as the siding is installed. Fiber cement siding costs about 20% more than vinyl, but remember, cement won't ever warp, rot, 
crack, or buckle. With easy installation and a 50-year warranty, cement siding may be what you're looking for to give your home's exterior an outstanding appearance. In today's Mortgage Moment, we'll discuss what really is a HUD home and how not to lose money when you buy one. Then Teresa Garrett helps you break the mold by creating your own custom trim work. And Steve Greenberg's been shopping again, this time for the high-tech bathroom accessories you'll want to have in your new house. If you'd like a detailed list of the tools and materials needed for any project that you've seen on the show, you can find it on the internet at www.michaelholligan.com. In today's mailbag, a viewer wrote in about a door problem that is common in many homes. Dear Michael Holligan, I'm having trouble with my deadbolt. I have to push the door in and out before it'll turn and lock. It seems to be sticking. Do you know why it would be doing this and how I can fix it? Margaret J. Houston, Texas. That sounds like a good problem for Teresa Garrett. That's exactly the same problem I'm having with this door. Trying to lock this deadbolt a lot of times is a real struggle and then it gets stuck too when we're trying to unlock it. What can happen is wood frame houses over a period of time seem to settle and shift and that can throw this door frame out of square. The problem is that the deadbolt is not lining up with the strike plate here in the door jamb. And you really need to fix this problem because it can only worsen over a period of time as your house continues to settle and shift. The first thing that you might want to try is some preventive maintenance. These screws are loose in this hinge and that's what's throwing this door off. So hopefully if we tighten these screws that will fix the problem. Alright, I've got all of the screws tightened up so let's see if that will fix our problem. Nope, unfortunately this deadbolt is still hitting on the strike plate for some reason. What we can do now is try to make some adjustments to our strike plate. I don't want to go to the trouble of having to measure and mark and trying to move this. The easiest way to make the, the adjustments would just be to mark the strike plate. That's going to tell me exactly where the deadbolt is hitting and catching. Now the easiest way to do that is to put something on your deadbolt that will leave a mark. I'm using caulk. You can also use chalk or you could even use lipstick if you wanted to. What you want to do is just put this all the way around the deadbolt, close your door, and then try to put your deadbolt in and this is going to leave a mark right on the strike plate. Let's see what happened. Okay, see the caulk right there? I can file that down and hopefully that will solve our problem and then the deadbolt should be able to go right in. What I'm using is a small rectangular file. And what's good about this, it's narrow enough to fit in this small area. Whenever you're using the file, you don't want to go back and forth like a saw because if you do, the teeth will fill up with shavings and eventually it won't cut anymore. Instead, just give it one stroke at a time, just like this. And even though the caulk is just in this one particular area, go ahead and file the whole piece from top to bottom. That will keep it nice and straight. Okay, I've got it. And it's nice and smooth all the way up and down. Now let's see if that will work. It does. It works like a charm. That's great. And that was an easy fix. If you would like more information on the project you've seen today or others, you can contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. If you're in the market for a new home, remember to check out HUD homes. They come in all shapes, sizes, and prices. HUD homes are regular homes that were deeded to HUD by mortgage companies that foreclosed on FHA insured mortgages. Some people think that you can buy a HUD home for a dollar or for nothing. That's not true. HUD wants to sell these homes quickly to maximize the return of the money the FHA mortgage insurance funded, so they're priced at fair market value. What's different about buying a HUD home is that there are no negotiations between you and the seller. HUD markets the property, then accepts sealed bid offers through participating licensed real estate brokers. The person making the highest acceptable bid is generally awarded the home. Offers on HUD homes can only be made through licensed real estate brokers. This ensures that HUD requirements are met and that the buyers get the help they need. 
HUD will even pay the real estate commissions of up to 6% if the commission amount is requested as part of the bid. HUD homes are sold as is. While many of them are in good condition, some do require a bit of TLC and some elbow grease. These properties can be great deals for fixer-uppers. While you're at it, check into HUD's 203K program and $5,000 escrow repair account. They could help you fix up your HUD home. HUD will not warrant the condition of its properties, but it will give you information about the condition of the property you're interested in. You can use this information to formulate your bid. HUD also urges you have the property professionally inspected before you finalize your bid. You don't have to be low income or meet any other limitations to buy a HUD home. If you have the money or can qualify for a mortgage, you can buy a HUD home. Many HUD properties are eligible for FHA insured mortgages, but you don't have to get an FHA insured loan in order to buy a HUD home. The best way to look for a HUD home is to first decide what you want in a home, then find a real estate broker who sells HUD homes. If your dream home is in the HUD listings, your broker will be able to help you find it and make it yours. If your baseboards in your home look like these, pretty old and worn out and ratty looking, you don't have to live with them anymore. Today I'll show you how you can build a three-piece baseboard to spruce up any room in your house. It's relatively inexpensive and it's a simple do-it-yourself project. Here's what I'm talking about. We're going to take this piece of flat board and attach a chair rail to the top and then put cord around all the way around. And like I said, this will help to spruce up any room. First thing that we need to do though is take up the old baseboards. What I'm using to take up the old baseboards is just a pry bar and a hammer. And I'm not going to worry too much about scuffing up the wall and the paint because the new baseboards that I'm putting on is going to cover that. Okay, this wall is 77 and 3 eighths. Now that I have all the baseboards off, I can cut this first flat board. And I've already painted this one, but these do come unfinished, so you'll be able to paint your flat board whatever color you want. And the flat boards come in various lengths and widths. Let me get this one marked. I'm using a hand miter box to cut this out. This is a very inexpensive tool, and I'm talking just a couple of dollars for this. I'm going to cut this first cut at a 45 degree angle and make an inside cut, and that's going to go right here in this corner. Alright, you'll want to put the long point of the 45 in the corner. So just set this down and then push it flat up against the corner. I'm using an MDF board or multi-density fiber board because it's cheaper, but you can use anything else that you want, be it pine or whatever. And I'm using two inch finishing nails to attach this to the wall. This is our second piece of flat board, and you can see why we cut these at a 45 degree angle because they fit together nicely. I'm also going to cut the chair rail and the cord around the same way. You'll need to put a nail about every 12 to 16 inches in your flat board. And there's no need to measure, just kind of eyeball it. Next we're ready to put on the chair rail and I've got several different examples of chair rail and moldings and different pieces to show you. You can make up whatever combinations you want. Here's one example of something you can do or you can even use a smaller piece and just do something simple like this. The piece that I've chosen for the chair rail is just a little more decorative than the rest and again I'm going to be cutting this just like I did the flat board at a 45 degree angle. So let me get this piece measured at 77 and 3 eighths. And like I told you, this is really a pretty simple project to do. For the chair rail, I'm going to be using a smaller nail. You can see that this is smaller in diameter and also the head of this nail is smaller. This is a one and a half inch finishing nail and the reason that I'm using this on the chair rail is because it's made of real wood and it can split, so we just need to be careful. Your MDF flat board will not split. Now when you put the nail in, you just want to put it right here in the center. So let me hammer this in. Now I'm going to use this nail set to go ahead and finish putting this nail all the way in. I didn't want to damage the wood with this hammer. Alright, this chair rail has been cut at a 45 degree angle as well. You can see 
how nicely all this is working out so far. We just need to attach this piece. After I'm completely finished, I can go back and fill in all of these holes and also the cracks with some caulk to make this look really nice. I'm using three quarter inch quarter round, but this comes in different sizes as well. And I've already cut this to size. Now when you're putting the quarter round on, you want to push this down snug on the carpet. And as you can see, this is closing the gap between the carpet and the flat board. And I'm using the same nails that I did on the chair rail. It's easier if you get your nail started first and then go ahead and push this down snug. And I'm nailing this through the quarter round into the MDF flat board. And again, I'm going to use the nail set just so that I don't damage the quarter round. If you'll get a paintable caulk, you'll be able to paint over this anytime that you want. So what you do is you just go and fill in all of the cracks and the holes that you've got. And then you'll want to wipe this and use a damp rag or a damp paper towel to, to wipe away the excess. You'll also want to fill in the gap right here at the top of the chair rail. So just take this all the way around your chair rail. Fill that in just like that. Now all I'm doing to finish this project up is just touching up with paint a little bit. We spent right at $100 for this, but you could spend more or less depending on what you want. But the most important thing is this has dramatically changed the looks of this room for the better. If you would like more information on this project or others, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. The roof of your new house can do a lot more than keep you dry. Michael covers all the angles when your new house continues. Have you discussed the roof elevation with your wife? You mean roof? Roof. Rough? Roof. Roof. Roof, rough. Hey, what am I hitting, dog? Hey, go get my leash, take me for a walk, long as you're happy. Roof, roof, rough. It doesn't matter what you call it, it is an important part of your house. It's a design element when you first pull up in front of a home. Plus, it's also a structural element. Without the roof, the walls will not stand up. Your house isn't designed that way. It's got to have a roof on top of it. And it's also the weatherproofing element on your house. It keeps out all that rain, hail, and snow, so it's very, very important. Now as far as design and how you build the house, a lot depends on the actual pitch that you pick for your roof. Pitch comes from flat, which is called a 0-12 pitch, to fairly steep, which would be a 12-12 pitch. How do you come up with those numbers, 12-12, 0-12, 6-12, 10-12? It's how much pitch angle is on your roof. When you have a flat roof, if you measure 12 inches across, it moves up and down zero. When you have a 6-12 pitch, if you'd measure 12 inches across on your roof, it would fall six inches. When you have a 12-12 pitch, if you measure 12 inches across your roof, it comes down 12 inches before you hit the roof again. That'd be a 45 degree angle. Now occasionally you even see them steeper than that, but normally most roofs nowadays goes from 6-12 to about 10-12, running that angle. Now the steep pitch is great if you live in an area where there's a lot of ice and snow because it doesn't build up as much on your roof. It just slides right off. The 612 pitch, what's great about that, it's less expensive because the less pitch, the less area that you actually have to shingle. The more pitch you have, the more lumber you're actually going to have to build your roof with, so a lot more shingles. Now the flat roofs, people use them sometimes where there's areas where there's very moderate rainfall and where there's very, very moderate snowfall, maybe in Arizona or Southern California. But as far as most homeowners, you're going to be somewhere between a 612, 812, and a 1012. When it comes to the design or the look of your roof, boy, there's a lot of choices there. Like here we have a gable projecting out for some bedrooms on the front of this house. It adds a lot of variety to the roof line, so it's really pleasant to the eyes when you first pull up. But like I said, the choices are endless. Let's take a walk around the neighborhood and look at some of the variety. Now I mentioned a gabled roof. That's a roof where two sides slope towards one another over a vertical wall. The two sloping sides come together to form a ridge. A ridge is the highest horizontal point on a roof. The inside angle formed by the two sections of a roof is called a valley. On this type of roof, all sides of the roof slope towards the ridge, so there are no vertical surfaces on the roof. This is called a hip roof. The outside angle formed by two sloping sides of the roof is called the hip. 
Roofs nowadays come in all shapes and designs, and it's pretty common to find a combination of design elements in a single roof, so you can let your imagination run free when it comes to the design of a roof on a new home. Well, your design choices for a roof are limitless, but always remember, the steeper the roof is, the longer it's gonna last in bad weather. The snow and the water will fall off of it and your shingles will have a longer life. But it's also gonna take a lot more shingles and a lot more material to build that roof because the steeper it is, the more area you have to cover. If you'd like more information about picking out the right roof for your house, contact us on the internet at michaelholligan.com. <laughs>
For more information on this scale or any of the other products we showed you in the Check This Out segment, check out our website at michaelholligan.com.